Okay, just a short update on what I've been doing over the past two months, along with uh, all the other things that I've had during this time, mainly the G-Skill Overclocking World Cup uh, qualifier competition, which was held online during uh, March and early April. I managed to get in the top four ranking of that online qualifier phase, and I will be attending the Overclocking World Cup competition live tournament, which will be held in Taipei, Taiwan during Computex of this year. So we'll see how it goes. But anyways, along with everything else that I've had during these past two months, I have been building a pre-overclocked system for another user who's also a member at our Finnish tech media site forum called IO Tech. He actually approached me during this past winter, like, would I be willing to do some overclock testing on his new parts he is going to be putting in his new system and would I be willing to do the deleting process on the actual CPU. It was actually uh, unknown would he choose a 1300K or the KS. He actually purchased both of them and he sent me both of those chips and we decided to go with the KS as it seemed to be a little bit better. But no, no big differences between the two as both of them weren't like among with the top range of CPUs I've seen this far. So anyways, he sent me the Asus Maximus Z790 Apex motherboard along with the 1300KS, which I already deleted on my previous video. And also for the memory, he decided to go with the best offering from G-Skill at the time of making this video, which well, this has been the highest range option from G-Skill for the Hynix ADI memory IC. So this is the uh, Trident Z5 RGB 8000CL38. So uh, this is definitely one of the best uh, options on the market for Hynix ADI. If you want to go with those type of memories and you should be aiming for Hynix ADI if you, if you are going to be buying any of these uh, 13th gen CPUs and especially a good motherboard that can do uh, memory frequencies of DDR5-7000 and beyond. So uh, as for the CPU overclocking, as we already know, the temperatures are so ridiculous already out of the box when you try the parts for the first time. So you pretty much hit 100 degrees Celsius, even in non-AVX based workloads, just at stock. So the first thing you usually do is undervolt the CPU, see if it still remains stable at the stock frequencies and see if you have any kind of overclocking headroom whatsoever. After deleting, we managed to squeeze at least 10 degrees from the uh, CPU's P core temperatures. And when I also use the Thermal Grizzly CPU contact frame for 12th and 13th gen CPUs, I managed to shave even another like five degrees from the P core temperatures as well. So the overall gain, what you can expect to get from this entire process can be close to like 15 degrees or so. It might depend on the uh, CPU itself, what exact cooler you are using, like do you have what kind of CPU water block, is it lapped or is it with its stock design, as not all of the CPU water blocks are fully flat, as I already explained on my previous video. Most of those CPU water blocks, they do actually take into account the unevenness of the CPU heat spreaders already by default. So uh, with that 15 degree reduction in temperatures, I managed to do a very mild overclock on the CPU. So the highest profile was 5.6 on the P cores and like 4.5 to 4.6 on the Atom cores and around 5 gigahertz on the cache. And the P cores were like designed that they would run at like 6.1 to 6 gigahertz for one core and two core operation. Then like <clears throat> 5.8 for three and four cores, 5.7 for five and six cores, and 5.6 for seven and eight cores. Yes, that is pretty much the same level as the stock operation. There is a mild overclock on the add-on cores, but you can't really uh, go too nuts on the CPU frequencies as the guy who sent me these parts he really stressed that he wants the system to be at least stable in uh, gaming situations and so on. Of course, you can hit nearly the same frequencies even at stock, but if the CPU is throttling constantly, 
you are losing a lot of performance. So you definitely don't want the CPU to throttle all the time because that definitely lowers your overall performance and it can also uh, reduce the lifespan of the CPU in the worst case. But we don't know how much these high, these high temperatures will affect the uh, overall lifespan of these CPUs because most of these CPUs can actually sustain pretty high temperatures for a while. But yeah, so that's the CPU part. Now with these uh, 13th gen CPUs and Z790 platform, the biggest spotlight on the overall performance gains is actually on the memory. So with memory, you can actually gain a lot more on the overall performance compared to CPU overclocking. So that's the overall, my opinion about this whole platform and launch. So you want to get the highest possible memory frequency with reasonable timings. The best configuration I got with realistic voltage of 1.5 or so was TDR5 8200 with timing table of like CAS 36, 48 or 47, 47 and I think the uh, TRAS was at like 48 or so and common rate 2, mo most of the second timings were set manually like pretty good like TRTP, 4 active window and the refresh interval was also set to the max value which really helps the overall uh, latency of the memory. And the last two of the third timing, so was it T, WR, WR, DR and DD, those were also set down to 4 and 4 on the highest profile. So that's pretty good overall baseline. So you want to get the most out of your memory and you cannot just skip the sub timings altogether. You should try to set the most important ones manually, especially the refresh interval TRFC to a pretty good level and the last two of the third timings. With that configuration, I think this overall setup is all right. Now I just have to make sure that I can ship these parts back to him like uh, safely because the uh, contact frame, it doesn't really have that much uh, like uh, length on the screws, as if you have seen the uh, video posted by De Bauer, you only tighten every single screw over here just very lightly. So there's a risk that this contact frame could actually come loose from the socket, but it's still relatively unlikely, if you ask me. So I'll have to I'll have to check if I should use some uh, like zip tie or some other form of protection during the shipping to hold the CPU in place. And again, the CPU is not re-glued. So uh, if they want to change the thermal interface material between the die and the IHS, it's very easy to do. Just remove the uh, contact frame, remove the uh, heat spreader from the CPU and just swap the thermal interface material. And he also sent me the d leading kit, which I used on the d leading video. So yeah, pretty good experience, but the d leading process was a lot more difficult compared to the previous generations, which normally used thermal paste instead of the solder tim between the die and the IHS. I don't know what kind of graphics card he will use. I think he will use at least some form of like M.2, but that's pretty much it. So uh, that's pretty much my overall like guideline. If you are building a daily system based on this new platform, don't stress the CPU overclocking part overly much, especially the cache. The cache is the least important factor from performance perspective from uh, four of those variables. So if you include like CPU, P cores, E cores, memory and uh, the cache, of course you will, you will see a very heavy performance reduction if you underclock the CPU very heavily. But if you ask me the uh, importance like uh, row is p cores then add-on cores then memory and then cache it's very easy to maintain stability on the cpu in avx based workloads if you use high enough uh, negative offset for the cpu so it will just downclock the cpu like 300 megahertz or even 400 megahertz in avx2 based workloads but the biggest difficulty is the temperature because if you use manual voltage it will uh, keep that voltage and it doesn't actually reduce it for those lower frequencies. So that's actually the hardest part about AVX based workloads. Yet in normal use cases, you don't really see that much AVX ut uh, utilization in just gaming use. That pretty much happens only in a workstation based 
like programs so I don't know if that will be an issue we'll see so uh, yeah that's pretty much it so uh, if you want to comment on this uh, like overall result yes I do know that the CPU overclock could be a tiny bit better but I want it to be like more safe than sorry and uh, yeah, these CPUs we tested weren't the best in the world. So we would have to get at least a tiny bit better 1300K or KS if we wanted to achieve like 5.7 to 5.8 in non-AVX based workloads for all of the eight cores being used at the same time. But just leave a comment down below if you want to comment about this uh, like result and this uh, rig. The Apex itself is pretty fine. I don't see uh, like overly massive differences between the Apex and the Dark Kimpin. To my findings, the Dark Kimpin can actually run higher frequencies in uh, performance-based tests in many situations. The uh, Apex was maybe a tiny bit better on the frequency validation this far, although now the difference is pretty much very minor as the Dark Kimpin has improved lots during these last two months or so. The only thing I really like about the Apex, which is not present on the other motherboard models, is the X socket. So this has both the LGA1700 mounting holes as well as the LGA115X mounting holes. So you can easily use your old cooling solution from the previous generations on this motherboard. That's pretty much it. So thanks for watching one of my videos once again. Maybe subscribe to my channel if you want to follow my content in the future and maybe check out my patreon page as well if you want to support my work and yeah thanks for watching one of my videos once again and i will see you on the next one